All right, go Cindy. Hi, everybody, and welcome again to one of our virtual library, our virtual library and virtual event uh, series. Uh, we are thrilled to have something a little different today. Um, we are learning about a healthy brain and healthy body, and uh, we have our Alzheimer's Association chapter of Texas uh guests today before we get started uh, if you would like to register for this event we put our registration link in the comments and you can get attendance credit for it well i'm not going to do a lot of speaking we have a wonderful speaker today miss miss maxine vieta and she will be um giving us some information. So everyone, enjoy. Hi, everyone. Maxime Vieta. I am the program director for the uh, Alzheimer's Association Capital of Texas chapter. If you want to reach out to your local chapter, we have six in Texas alone. And you can always call Helpline, which is available as well, 24-7 for you to have that information um, um, that is closest to you, right? Today's presentation is the healthy living for your brain and body. The more we get research surrounding Alzheimer's disease and what role does nutrition and exercise plays in our brains and bodies as we age, the more information we have whether our habits right now make a difference in how we further develop, um, either whether we will have a cognitive decline earlier in life, later in life, and what that looks like. So. I'll touch upon that very briefly in today's presentation. Thanks for joining us today. With much, with that much, we'll go ahead and start the presentation, right, Cindy? All right. So today, again, we want to make sure that we identify the reasons for taking care of ourselves. Uh, it is very important, especially right now during COVID, um, that we take extra help, extra caution um, as far as how we're dealing with our brains and how we want to have mental health. We want to be healthy once we go back to the office, whatever engagement may look like once we are back. As for us, the Alzheimer's Association, we continue to be working remotely until further notice. Uh, we do miss interaction with um, our, our families and the people who have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. But until that happens, this is what we're doing today. You know, we, through this presentation, we will list the strategies to age well in the following areas, physical health and exercise, diet and nutrition, cognitive activity, and social engagement. Oh, Ms. And if you Vieta. have any questions as we go through this presentation, please add them in the chat, and we will be more than glad to address these questions. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I just wanted to make sure to share your screen first. I didn't know if you started your presentation yet. Oh, my apologies. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. I thought I was sharing. Maybe I wasn't sharing. <laughs> I will get that going. Can you see me? Yes, right? Yes, we see you. Perfect. All right. Let me go ahead and start go. my presentation. Can you see that? Yes, ma'am. Perfect. Can you see that as well? Yes. Perfect. My apologies. Little glitch it happens all the time. <laughs> Aging and health. Aging will depend on, on our genes, our environment and lifestyle. How many of us are really well, aging really well? Like if you're in your 50s and somebody asks, well, how old are you? And you don't even show the ages of, you know, the signs of aging that you look very young. So, I mean, those are good genes to have, right? That we're not aging as fast as, as, we normally would or in how it had happened in, in years past. We're taking better care of ourselves. Our environment does play a huge part as far as how we would definitely um, age in the past as well or how we age and so on. And also your lifestyle cho choices. I know that their most recent research was released uh, last July in 2020 that what we eat and how we keep and maintain in our younger eight years does affect how we age and how we have cognitive decline. So if that's true, 
start thinking about what are we eating today? I love sweet bread. That is my weakness. I will never give it up as much as I tried. It just doesn't happen, right? But I also know that I have a family with a history of cognitive, uh, I mean, a cognitive impairment because my mother had Alzheimer's disease. She also it was the result of a vascular dementia. So all of those things come into play. So I have to be that much more aware of the things that I eat as well as how often do I exercise. I'm not saying that I do it and that I'm good at it, but I do have to be fully aware of what those choices are for myself so that I can also age healthy and hopefully postpone any cognitive decline um, to later in life. Can you still see that that slide, Cindy? Yes, okay. So how the brain works, the best way that I can explain it in, um, in our terms and that we can fully understand. So imagine our brains being a distribution center. In a distribution center, you have multiple trucks coming in and leaving with goods and, and leaving and coming and delivering and so on. When there is a breakdown in that system, it backs everything up. So essentially, it's the same thing that happens in our brains. We have a distribution center in our brains that is fed and also feeds out information. So once there is a breakdown in our neurons and how the, the multiple cells connect in our brains, when there is a breakdown in that, there is a delay in responses. There's a delay in how we communicate. In many cases, individuals who already have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease can have a coherent moment and have and give the false hope to their families that they're going to be doing really well, right? Because they're having a good conversation with them. Ms. Oh, Vieta, we can't see you or hear you. My apologies. <laughs> Dogs started barking and I wanted to keep them away from this. Oh, from this okay. sound. We can add a, a dog in here. My sincere apologies. As, as I was saying, once there is a breakdown in all those things and given the false hope to families that there is, that they, maybe they're getting better, it is just a split second. So you can have a very coherent conversation with someone and then just like that, be it gone. Because again, you're dealing with, um, I'm, oh, there it is, my video, I'm sorry. Can you see the presentation? Yes, I'm sorry. Um, you know, having those, those interruptions and so on. So this is why it's important that we start thinking about the disease as being a very progressive op opportunity for the disease to further develop, have more cognitive decline. The goal, because where there is no treatment right now, is really to, to mitigate the disease process and find ways of how to delay the full onset of it. I lost my turn of thought, my apologies. Just like I said, I was trying to mitigate the sound with my, <laughs> with the dogs. The heart and brain connection, again, vascular dementia. It is the second most commonly diagnosed other than Alzheimer's disease. While vascular dementia does lead to a Alzheimer's disease, in many cases, individuals have both a dual diagnosis of a vascular dementia, and if you're not familiar with vascular dementia, is really that de deprivation of oxygen to the brain as a result of a diabetes, that condition, or hypertension, a stroke, and things like that, right? So with that, you can see the decline a lot faster because someone can be very level for a very long time and then have a mini stroke or have something happen to the brain because there's, there's not enough oxygen going to it, then they have a very significant decline. Whereas with Alzheimer's disease, it's a very slow progression, almost like a wiper effect where it starts with the new memories and it eventually goes into the old memories and so on, right? So how do we protect our heart? Again, it goes back to healthy eating, exercise, and so on. What I do want you to keep in mind though, as we go through this presentation and even dealing with nutrition and exercise is that you may be the healthiest person. You may have not one stitch of fat in your body and still drop from a heart attack. So there's no 100% guarantees. There's nothing that is a 100% proof of how to keep, but again, it does mitigate and it does help maintain a little bit longer. I kind of 
or went over what dementia and Alzheimer's is, right? So dementia, think of the dementia as the world term or of uh, the word term cancer. Under cancer, you have different diagnoses, right? And somebody wants to know what form of, of cancer they have, whether it's lung cancer, breast cancer, and so on. So when someone gets diagnosed with dementia, you want to know what form of dementia is it. And based on the pathology, behaviors, and everything that the doctors take into consideration, family history, your own medical history, and so on, the doctor can arrive at the proper diagnosis. As I mentioned just, just before is Alzheimer's is the most commonly diagnosed. We're at 70% and more, followed by a vascular dementia as a result of diabetes, hypertension, strokes. The Lewy body dementias, which is almost a form of Parkinson's where there's a lot of rigidity in the body, a lot of hallucinations, more violent outbursts and behaviors, and so on. And again, if you want to know more in depth of each one of these dementias, you can always go to our page at ALZ.org and find the most commonly diagnosed dementias that exist today. And in many cases, we're starting to see a very much younger group of individuals be diagnosed with a dementia because they are veterans of, of one of our wars, right? And they might have had a trauma. They might have had a, a traumatic brain injury. And although TBIs can be an immediate effect when it comes to memory loss, it could also be one of those that has a long-term effect, meaning they will probably won't see the effects of it until they're older in life, right? So we want to make sure that we know our history, especially our medical history, what has happened to us so that we can mitigate those conversations. So what does taking care of ourselves as we age mean? There's many components to this. And, and again, there is not one method or methodology to think about that is 100% proof. What is true though, is that what you do today and it is under the advisement of your physician and it makes you feel good, then by all means, we're gonna support it, right? But it starts with the physical health and exercise. How many of us go, for example, um, I try, which I haven't done in the last few weeks, to walk every day um, as per not. My nutritionist, it's not about how many miles you walk, but it's how, um, how, how long do you walk. So it means I'm supposed to walk 30 minutes every day or at least three times a week so that I can maintain and even start to lose weight to make an effect as far as how I'm supposed to feel. If you like walking, if you like you know, playing basketball or doing volleyball, whatever it is that you like to do to keep active, continue doing those things. You, those things are good, right? So in a sense, it's just trying to find the right fit for us. Not trying, if you're trying to run a marathon, by all means do it, but it's not necessarily trying to be in a competitive sport. It's just really defining that right activity that really fits with your uh, lifestyle, with the level of engagement that you choose to have and how it makes you feel afterwards, right? So that's where we started with physical health and, and exercise. I like walking. I don't do it often. I should, but I don't. But it, one of those things that once I start getting back in the, in the rhythm of it, I really do enjoy it. But I'm also one of those people that I prefer to have a buddy that keeps me honest, that keeps me engaged. Because if I leave it to my own devices, I, get, I tend to get lazy and I'd rather watch I don't know, Netflix and binge watch a series and go walking. But essentially, I should be doing it because it does make me feel better once I start um, engaging in things, right? Um, you know, what are the, uh, what are the um, benefits of having physical activity and exercise? It does help with our cardiovascular activity to reduce some of the cognitive decline, either whether immediate or later in life. Uh, regular and rigorous exercise can lead to increased blood flow. Again, that oxygen flow to the brain that does help maintain our brains healthy and so on. So it does help, right? Again, everything that we present in the community when it comes to these tips and whatnot, it is based on actual science and facts. We want to make sure that we're providing you with the most accurate research that is available um, out in, in the field right now. And again, as I mentioned, there's no one single recipe or one single exercise that is going to be best unless that's what you enjoy. So if you enjoy walking, that is going to be the activity that you're going to enjoy the most. And more than likely, you're not even going to fight it, right, to go do it. If it's cycling, that's what you enjoy, then that's what you're going to be doing. Taking precautions right now because of the current COVID-19 uh, circumstances and that we're living through a pandemic, 
you know, finding the right space to where you're not in crowded spaces that you're following the CDC guidelines for health distancing and so on. You want to continue and maintain those safe practices throughout. Let's hear from Woodley as he discussed his um, engagement and exercise. It's surprising how you can easily build up habits of just taking 15 to 20 minutes out of your day to go down, hit the treadmill, and just do it. Just do it. Just get on it, put my headphones on, and just walk at a nice brisk pace for myself, build up a quick heartbeat, quick sweat, and it's amazing how quickly I can go from 15 minutes to 20 minutes and then over time 30 minutes and over time 40 minutes before you know it you know you're up to 45 minutes of walking and even at a higher incline and also at a higher pace and again it's all about incorporating habits and the choices that we make so true right you know what do we do how do we engage and and what is it that we like to do? Um, as I said, my nutritionist recommended I should do 30 minute walks at least three times a week. Um, I fail miserably, but I'm trying to get better at it for sure. <laughs> and so again, what can we do? Do something that you like. You know, we want to make sure that we find the right thing that is is more fun to us so that we can continue to do it more often and more consistently. Start out small. Nobody's asking that we do a marathon at from the get go. I have a group of friends that they, they do marathons every year, and and they actually promote one as well. And um, they've incorporated the 0. 0.5 mile marathon into it. I said, oh, I can do that one. That's not even a stretch, right? But again, it's things that you want to make it fun. You want to make it entertaining for yourself. And and again, because it does make us stay more active in things that we do. Um, get your heart rate up and then ask a buddy to join you. And again, everything that we do when, we, when we're talking about engaging in physical activity, please ask your physician to see if it's the right thing for you to do at that moment. Um, if you have joint you know, deterioration or heart issues, you want to make sure that you're healthy enough before you engage and cause further damage um, to those things already. Again, if you have any questions or any comments, please add them in the chat and we will definitely follow up upon ending this presentation. So again, we, we continue talking about physical health and exercise. Some of the things that we also can mitigate and to avoid some of these um, long-term effects that we may have from these things and may they may cause cognitive decline is to stop smoking if you are a smoker. You know, stopping um, smoking is always one of those good habits. Avoid excess alcohol, you know, getting enough sleep. You know, if somebody already has the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease and they're not sleeping well because they're either snoring, you know, how they may have the apnea or they're not getting enough oxygen as, as they, they sleep overnight, that can also make the behaviors and the confusion a lot worse. So somebody can have, you know, go to bed and not be able to sleep and have insomnia, that can really make the behaviors a lot worse than, than, um, than our, what you're already dealing as far as the disease process. Avoiding any head injury that you also, you know, practice safe um, mitigation practices when you're doing your cycling or when you're doing boxing, whatever it is that you choose, that you also practice those safety um, regulations. And to depression, often, often, we see in our senior population a lot of depression because they isolate, especially right now in seeing COVID-19 and CDC guidelines, because we're not engaging with the community as, as we have in the past, or we don't have the same outlets for destruction or even to engage in, in, in meaningful activities. We're starting to see a higher number of depression amongst both caregivers and individuals who have a disease or a diagnosis already. So it's important that once we start to see ourselves go down a rabbit hole, that we address it with our doctor, that we visit with them, you know, regularly. As a caregiver, we tend to neglect our own health and not reach out to medical professions or professionals until it's too late. So it is important that if you recognize this, the signals that you're struggling with your daily, that you, there's some things that you're starting to miss. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have a dementia. It could very well be depression. Depression does mimic some of the symptoms of, of Alzheimer's disease or any other form of dementia in the sense of getting forgetful, 
not being able to remember dates and so on. So it is important that we follow up with our physicians on a regular basis to make sure that we're, that we're doing well. And so what can we do? Again, make sure that we're following our, our diet and nutrition to address blood pressure, to make sure that we are maintaining healthy, uh, to do the blood sugar levels that we are maintaining as well, weight and cholesterol. And I know that this may be one of those conversations that happens quite often and a lot of times, but those are the realities, right? Those are the things that start to happen when we're dealing with the vascular dementia, especially in our elderly population, and also, you know, when they're dealing to leading to a to an Alzheimer's associate uh, an Alzheimer's diagnosis, is that we're dealing with these factors that are like that are keeping the right amount of oxygen to go our, to our brains and thus creating more mental confusion. Uh, are we forgetting to eat? Are we forgetting to drink water? And believe it or not, dehydration in itself can mimic a lot of the symptoms that we have when it comes to a, a diagnosis of dementia. Obviously, the doctor is the only one that can, they can tell exactly what's going on with that person. This is why when you start to see some of these symptoms emerge around confusion of time, not eating well, not drinking enough water, maybe having a urinary tract infection or UTIs, that you go to the doctor and address those conditions because they can be reversed and treated. Whereas if it is indeed a diagnosis of, a, of a, any form of dementia, at least you know by that point and we can mitigate and start having these conversations with other resources and are available to you in the community. So let's talk about diet and nutrition. What comes to mind when you hear diet and nutrition? I mean, to me it's like, okay, I have to cut out my sweets, my sodas, my ice cream, and those are just like my, my comfort foods, right? So is it an emotional eating that I'm having or is it really my, I don't know, my go-to foods at the end of the day as a reward for having been at work all day and having all these things? You know, whatever food may represent to each one of us, these are the things that we want to start looking at um, as we start to, to talk about nutrition, you know? And um, it does affect um, the heart, you know, the way that we eat does affect our heart, our, our blood glucose and things like that, right? Um, the more nutritious food that we have, the better fuel for our brains. I can use myself as an example. Um, I found myself in a situation where I thought I was drinking enough water, which I wasn't apparently, and I thought I was eating well enough, but I was under eating. And before I knew it, I started having these headaches and, and confusion and, and like a brain fog of sorts. And I was I couldn't quite figure it out what that was coming from because I thought I was doing the right things. Come to find out that I wasn't, I was under eating and I was under drinking water and I had a severe dehydration that I had to deal with. And so I had to have the proper hydration treatments in order for me to be stabilized because I was, you know, everything was just out of whack. So it is important that as we get older, we recognize that we have to start, you know, thinking and making sure that we drink enough water throughout the day, that we make sure that we listen to the new signals that are changing in our bodies, because maybe we don't get the same triggers for hunger as we used to when we were younger, right? But think about it, those triggers come about as well because we're engaged and we're doing more activities. The older we get, we tend to be less active and less engaged. And so thus, it, it just gets really confusing when it comes down to it. And what we do know about diet these days is that some of these dietary guidelines, for example, the most commonly talked about is the Mediterranean diet, does help reduce some of the inflammation and some of the um, conditions, the effectiveness that it, that it has on a person um, that has either heart disease, cancer, you know, the Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. So again, things that we can discuss with our doctors to make sure that we're following the right, you know, nutritious path, that we're having plenty of water and what is the best for ourselves, right? We wanna make sure that we have those common cores. And I'm gonna play another video from one of our directors of nutrition and see what she has to say as well. Foods that have been shown to um, lead to healthy aging would be uh, fruits and vegetables, and in particular, green leafy vegetables and berries. 
as well as limited intake of high fat food items that you get through high fat dairy and cheese and red meats and also um, healthy vegetable oils. So this would be, olive oil would be a good example, have been shown to reduce your risk of heart disease as well as dementia. How many of you find yourselves actually missing your fruits when you don't have them? Like I do, like I, I get in this habit that I'm traveling and, uh, oops. Did I just stop sharing and accidentally miss? There you go. Can you see it now? Cindy, can you see the screen? Yes, okay. Um, I was saying that, you know, how we find ourselves sometimes eating different foods, like, especially when we travel, we, we tend to go for the things that are easy for us to snack on, right? But eventually you start missing your fruits. Like it happens to me quite often when, as soon as I get home, it's like, I want a banana, I want an apple and things like that. Right. And it feels so much better for me to have those things. Not necessarily saying that I feel that much more guilty for having had my snacks, but nonetheless, you know, it does feel better. And so the recommendation from our nutritionist is that, you know, we, we want to eat more vegetables. We want to incorporate more fruits, nuts, and so on, and, and healthy vegetable oils into our daily consumption of food. You know, obviously the always having the, um, the items that we can avoid, for example, saturated trans fats, you know, processed foods, solid fat, sugar, and salt, and, um, anything that's, that's fried or anything that, that is deemed as, as an unhealthy fast food, right? We want to make sure that we limit that consumption or that we limit how often we had it, have it, um, so again, if you want to have your cheat days, really, that is up to you. If you want to have a very strict dietary um, day of how, what you want to eat, really up to you. But again, make sure that your doctor's aware of the diets that you're, that you're trying, the foods that you're trying to eat. Um, because believe it or not, some of these foods may interact with medication that you're taking already or supplements that you may start taking over the counter may very much interact with medications that you take. And in many cases, if the person already has a dementia, make the behaviors a lot worse and the way they carry their days a lot worse. And so we want, again, want to mitigate conversations. We want to mitigate behaviors, making sure that we maintain and so on. As I was mentioning about um, consult, you know, re the, the resources that we have available for diet, dietary supplements and vitamins, uh, making sure again, that your doctor is fully aware of the things that you're taking over the counter, new supplements, the diets that you're following. So again, so that we can mitigate so that you don't get worse or that you don't get sick while trying to mitigate the cognitive decline and so on. And then we want to talk about how do we engage our brains? How do we maintain and stay active as we age and get older? What I will say to you is it isn't about doing the same things that we do all the, all the time that we are good at that helps and maintains the brain. It is challenging our brains to do one new activity that you have never done before and once you master that activity, moving on to another activity or engagement that helps our brains maintain. So if you're really good at puzzles, don't keep doing puzzles. Do something new. Maybe if you've never played the piano, learn, learn how to play a piano. If you've never played dominoes, learn how to play the dominoes and so on. So it is the way to maintain the brain it is to do an activity that we have never done before. That's how we keep our, our brain fitness. It's not necessarily continue to do the things that we are good at because we already know how to do it. So as, as I was talking about cognitive activity, keep it in mind active forms, new connections among brain cells. So we want to grow, uh, grow new brain cells. We want to start doing something completely new to us. You know, but the activity or the cogn cognition of our brain is really dependent and beholden of, of 
blood flow to the brain. So if you already have diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, uh, TBI, and so on, these can be factors that can affect how well we keep up or things that we do or to mitigate when do we have the full effect of cognitive decline and so on. You know, we want to make sure that we're finding activities that are engaging to us. And again, it, it, the key to it is that you find something that is new to us, not something that we are really good at already. Let's go ahead and hear from Dr. Bennett and in regards to this as well. One of the most interesting factors is cognitive stimulating activities, which basically for us just means uh, mental processing of information. Um, it can be from a book, it can be from the radio, it can be a magazine, it can be from a lecture, it can actually be from watching TV. All of these things require processing information. And the old adage of, you know, use it or lose it is actually something that turns out, at least from the observational data, to look like it's true. So numerous studies now have shown that being more engaged um, in cognitively stimulating activities is actually good for maintaining cognition. And it's true in late life, and it's true in early life. And so what we recommend is that you start early, and if you're already late, start now. Pretty interesting information, right? The fact that there is actual research and, and things that back up those conversations about engaging in new activities that are going to help us um, really regenerate brain cells or or grow new cells in our brains to maintain cognition. You know, again, some of these recommendations is read books and articles that can challenge you. Uh, completing puzzles and play games. Hi, my challenge for myself. I want to learn how to play um, chess. I find it fascinating. I think it's one of those things that is the most intense there is as, as a puzzle and things like that. So I want to learn how to do it. Just haven't found the right people to teach me, but I will. I that's going to be one of my goals for this year for sure. And and learning new skills and hobbies. If you have never done a stitch in your life, for example, I'm also learning how to hem my own pants because I want to learn. I've never done it, but I'm I'm learning it. Um, saw my mother and my sister do it flawlessly. I I was completely the opposite, but I think it's one of those things that as I get older, I want to not only honor them but also learn it for myself. And always engaging in, on, in ongoing learning, whatever that may look for you, whatever that may entail, just continue um, doing new things that are completely new to you that you can engage and challenge your brain um, as activities. So now we go into social engagement. What does that look to you? I know that right now it may be a little bit difficult to really determine what social engagement is going to look. And we still don't know what it's going to look like once we're over this pandemic or when we are, are told or deemed that, that it's safe enough for us to start engaging basically the same level that we were prior to um, working from home or staying home conditions and so on. But social engagement can be a phone call. If you can't see your friends, that just means a phone call. Like, are you engaging with your loved ones via a phone call? Is it, I mean, I know that all of us are really zoomed out at some point because we've had nothing but, you know, social platforms to connect. But is it really just seeing that face-to-face -face interaction with, with somebody? I, for myself, I'm a social butterfly, so I did have a very difficult time assimilating. And I still find myself in that threshold. I, I want to do things and I get anxious because I want to see my friends. I want to engage with the community. I want to start seeing my colleagues. And obviously I can't see, I can't see them. To me, the social platform is not the same as having that one-on-one. -on -one. But again, I have to work around it and find the best way for me to mitigate um, that anxiety that I have that I cannot engage with individuals. Social engagement is associated with living longer and with fewer disabilities. What we do know for a fact is that our senior population tends to be more self-isolating and go to less places as they used to because their mobility is more com compromised. They probably can't drive as well as they used to because of a vision impairments. And if it's somebody with dementia, you know, think about all the things that they have to stop doing for the safety of themselves and others. I mean, they can't drive anymore because that's, they, they don't connect the red, green, and, and yellow 
uh, lights anymore. They don't know what the brakes mean. They don't know what the stop sign means. So we want to keep them from driving, right? And for the caregiver, if their partner or their spouse or sibling was the one that was the driver all the time and they were just the passenger, so now you have three individuals in the same household, for example, that are no longer as active or as engaged because one individual is now being compromised. So those are the factors that come into play as to why we see more of an isolation in our senior population and how their once immense world and circle of, of friends and influence has reduced to maybe the two of them and maybe the one. So we may, we keep those things in mind and we try to socialize with them either going through a senior center and things like that, which are very difficult right now because of the conditions that we're currently living in. Just keeping that in mind as we have talk about social engagement. You know, again, having those activities that we wanted to learn, you know, that we haven't done before, this is a prime opportunity for us to do it without any distractions, right? How many of us want to do, say, take and learn how to dance and you dance, like, to stepping or or salsa, whatever that may look like, and you haven't done it because you don't have the time and ability, is there an opportunity for it to happen now? Maybe this is the time that you want to do it because we have we don't have as many distractions as we normally do um, in during our, our days. As I mentioned, we can visit with friends and family, albeit that we can't do it maybe right now in person until um, this, the CDC deems it you know, safe enough for us to engage, but we can still pick up that phone and call our loved ones, our friends, and and, and check up on them, see how they're doing, um, and stay you know engaged through the media platforms that we already currently have. And um, once we're back to to safely engaging, volunteer outside the house. You can volunteer with the association. You can volunteer with the Red Cross. You can volunteer with your church. There's di different ways in which you can continue to engage, no matter your age, as long as you're healthy enough to go, um, that you can take those opportunities or join a club. I mean, if you have always liked to to cycle, you know, to to ride your bicycle, is there a bicycle club that you want to join? I know that when I used to work for the Red Cross, it was a group of individuals that liked the CB radios, and they themselves nationwide had formed their own little club, and when we would have um, storms or, or hurricanes that the power would go down and there was no communication. They all would rally and make it happen so that there was communication. And, this, and we're talking about individuals who were retired engineers, retired professors, you know, um, everybody who had, had a different career throughout their lives that now had a new form of engagement through the CB uh, radio club and how they thrive during a disaster in the sense of that they had a purpose for them to continue engaging and providing a service to the community. So there's many ways in we can continue to engage socially. Again, once it's deemed as safe enough for us to do it and whatever safety may look for you, I mean, based on your own personal choices. Oh, let's hear from our very fabulous Dr. Thies, our former chief scientific officer and how he talks about putting all these pieces together, how it starts with the physical activity, making sure that we're, you know, socially engaged, that we're eating and following certain dietary guidelines for our own safety. And also how do we keep our brains engaged throughout this whole time? And let me tell you, the better we are getting at diagnosis Alzheimer's disease and any other form of dementia, we are identifying individuals a uh, much sooner in that disease process than ever before. So whereas somebody who, who was in their 30s was getting misdiagnosed for other conditions and not officially diagnosed until they were 50 or 60, are now being identified earlier in the disease process. If they're 50, we're not waiting five or six years for things to come into play to say, okay, you have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's. We can actually diagnose them earlier in the disease process. Recently, at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference, there was a study reported of the results of a large clinical trial that was done in the Scandinavian countries. And in this trial, they took half the people in the trial and they adjusted their exercise level, their diet, uh, their social engagement, uh, and their mental stimulation. They, they developed programs for each one of those variables 
uh, changed all of those for the people that were in the test group and the control group just lived as they had been. There is a tremendous benefit to doing studies where we make changes and observe after the fact. That's a much stronger study than just observing people and trying to make judgments um, after life has changed for them. To my mind, one of the things that this has done is it, it's changed the, the force of uh, recommendation that we might make around uh, the benefit of these interventions for prevention of Alzheimer's disease or for brain health. And the fact is that I think it's moved it from possibly exercise, diet adjustments, social engagement, mental stimulation are useful to probably. And that's a big change and makes it easier for people to make those kinds of adjustments um, for the benefit of their future health. Every year, the Alzheimer's Association uh, convenes researchers worldwide to come um, and speak and present on the most latest research. And the thing that we have heard consistently for the last uh, couple of years is talk about talks about nutrition and exercise and what that role plays as we get older. So the choices that we make today really may affect in the long term um, as far as cognitive cognition and and um, and getting a diagnosis for a dementia and so on. So what can you do today? What can we do right now for ourselves? You know what? Um, just having a starting point. Um, if you have been delaying really going on riding your bicycle or just having that first walk, even if it's only 15 minutes around the around your neighborhood, and if it's safe enough for you and others, then you can continue to do that as well. You know, start small. Again, no one is expecting us to run a marathon at this point. We just want to make sure that we are engaging and doing something that is going to help us in the long run and, and making a plan and having the healthy choices for ourselves and always getting the support from others. The one thing that I would recommend is that you please contact um, your physician before you start any exercise or diet so that they, you're okay and it doesn't affect you um, in the immediate or long term thereafter. We are the best advocates for our own health. We want to make sure that we are also the very savvy consumer that if you find a drug that is telling you that with this drug, you can reverse the, the effects of Alzheimer's disease. I can tell you from the standpoint of the association, there isn't enough research right as of right now to really claim any medication or say that any medication is an effective treatment for reversing the Alzheimer's disease. We know that there's me there's medications and treatments available that can delay the full onset of the disease or delay some of it, but not really reverse any effects. Um, and again, they're designed for the early to moderate stages of the disease process. Once you are already further along in the disease, there's nothing that you can take at that point that is really going to help with the disease process other than just help you mitigate behaviors, um, anxieties, and so on. Make sure that um, if you always have a question in regards to medication, supplements, over-the-counter, uh, vitamins, and things like that, that you always consult your health care professional so that they can give you the best um, response in accordance to your own health and, and benefit to you at that point. And should you find yourself in the need or because you have a diagnosis or you are yourself a caregiver, that you please don't hesitate to contact us. We have a fabulous 800 number that is available to you 24-7. Um, it is managed in several languages it, and also managed by professional licensed counselors. And the services are free. You can call any time of the day. If it's 2 in the morning and you're having some, some concerns because you're becoming more forgetful than none, that you also want to talk to them. And again, if, if that is what is starting to happen and, it's, and the changes are so significant, that they are interfering with your daily life, please talk to your doctor. We want to make sure that it's something that it could easily be corrected, such as a vitamin deficiency, dehydration, and so on. But if it is official and it's a diagnosis, that at least you know um, what's changing with you. We have several plat platforms online that are similar to that, like the Facebook or, or things like that, like the Alzheimer's Navigator um, that are usually there for you to connect with other individuals that are caregivers or individuals with dementia. 
that you can communicate with them and it's completely private. We don't have access to it. So it's only the people that you allow in, in that in that nucleus. The community resource finder was designed in partnership with the um, AARP to give you access to the resources that are, are available closest to you based on your zip code. If you're the caretaker, whether you're long distance or in the same community, and you live, say, in New York, and your parents live in Texas, just put in their zip code, it would give you access to the resources that are local to them. And everything that we do right now is available online, but you can always benefit from these talks. For example, we, we appreciate the, the platform for us to present this information, as well as our, our own our virtual platforms. You can go to ALC.org or call the helpline and they can give you the most um, the newest dates that are coming um, your way. You can get involved by um, either signing up for a trial match. There's so many, there's so much research, not just based on medication or clinical trials, but there are also social engagement. There's nutrition based um, social research that is happening. If you're interested in based on, on, on where you're at right now and your criteria, they might find one that may be the closest to you advocate there's no best way to engage your time than to advocate for the reforms and changes that are going to benefit not only the person with the disease but also the caregiver and and making making sure that we have more information and more resources available to these two groups as the disease progresses we have a fabulous walk to end alzheimer's we are gearing up for this season this year starting in september but you can engage today, the longest day, we, we, we celebrate on June the 21st, which is the longest day in the calendar. That is the summer equinox, if I'm not mistaken. And while we choose to do something fun and fundraise at the same time, it is really a means of us bringing awareness to the caregivers that they don't have a break. They don't get to do something fun sometimes. They're always caring for somebody um, with a disease. And if you want to do presentations such as this one and other ways of engagement or participate in any one of these, whether it's advocacy, um, the longest state committees or the walk to endosimers, education and so on, you can volunteer with us. We always welcome you um, and we'll find the, the best way for you to engage with our organization. Don't forget that in addition to us, we also have other groups. You know, we have the area agencies on aging. They are designed to help up with resources. We have the National Institutes of Health that has more information on their pages and so on. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us, to them directly, uh, to Cindy, uh, to connect you with us. We can definitely help you um, have these conversations and hopefully find the right resources to you. Once again, I just want to highlight the fact that we have a helpline that is available to you 24 seven. Um, the numbers on the screen, it's 1-800-272-3900. If you need any help, you want to, you have a question as to why you took a vitamin or your loved one took a vitamin tonight and all of a sudden they're acting out, um, is they're interacting while well, we ask that you call 911 or their physician but if you're having questions over the counter medication or supplements, you can definitely call that 800 number um, to talk you through those conversations. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of our presentation. However, we are available for Q&A. If you, if you have any questions, uh, we will be here for a little bit while longer to address those questions. Denise, is, are there any uh, questions in the comments? No, ma'am. Okay. Well, I, I have a couple of questions. Um, Absolutely. With this helpline, um, either on the helpline or on your website, if you are concerned um, about a loved one or, or yourself, um, it's like, I keep forgetting something or I keep dropping my keys or I keep something. Do they have any type of, um, uh, guidelines, or is this something you would recommend that a person go to their doctor if they've got these concerns? If you're not quite ready to go to the doctor just yet, because, you know, some of us are very procrastinators when it comes to our health, right? You can call the 800 number and they kind of will give you the 10 warning signs, right? Which is starts with the memory, but it's much more than just the memory. I mean, it's getting um, also 
stop doing things that you normally would do. For example, like if you were an avid, you know, bingo player or, or you like to read a lot and all of a sudden you stop doing things that we knew of you doing. I mean, those are changes that start to happen. This doesn't necessarily mean that you have a dementia, but it does beg the question as to what is changing. There could be depression. It could be different things, but most definitely there is uh, 10 warning signs that individuals can can uh, follow through. It's when these changes start to interfere with your daily life that you want to pay attention and go to your doctor to make sure that it's something that could easily be treated or if indeed it's a diagnosis, at least you know at this point um, what that diagnosis may be. Um, and you said that uh, you're finding a lot more of, of the Alzheimer's showing up in younger people. Correct. Um, is, is this a new trend or is it because people are eating more fast food or the pandemic or what, what's happening? It, it's not necessarily related to that. I mean, although those are factors that influence as to why some individuals are starting to show or exhibit signs of dementia, but it's that we're better at diagnosing the disease process. You know, now there is a dye they, in, they can use when they do a CAT scan of the brain to actually see the shrinkage of the brain almost like saying in real time and seeing ventricles missing. So if, you know, before the way that individuals would actually know that they had a dementia was either because something significant had happened, whether they got lost driving or they burned down the kitchen because they forgot they had something on the stove or upon death, when they would do the autopsy of the brain, they could see the shrink, you know, the shrinkage of the brain and the ventricles missing. Because we now have better technology to see the brain in through this CAT scans and through that dye, we can actually diagnose someone. They can, someone can actually be diagnosed earlier in the disease process. Thank you. Well, you said that uh, there's Alzheimer's and then there's cardiovascular issues. Correct. Blood mm -hmm. pressure. Um, would it be like also blocked arteries? Anything Correct. like that? Yes, um, anything that, that will affect the, the flow of oxygen to the brain, such as the diabetes, you know, hypertension, strokes, blocked arteries, um, cholesterol, all of these come into play when it comes to how well we get oxygen to our brain that may eventually become a vascular dementia. And and can a physician, like you go to the physician, they take a blood test or order different tests and that would uh, tell you right there whether you're working with cardiovascular as opposed to uh, Alzheimer's? So it's really a, when the doctor is trying to diagnose an individual with either a dementia or any other condition is really an elimination process, right? They want to do the blood work to eliminate the things that could potentially be of increased risk at this moment, but they can reverse those effects, whether it's dehydration, a vitamin deficiency, um, a UTI, urinary tract infections, the older we get, the harder it is for us to fight those infections. So in a senior population, it, it's that much more um, concerning because you start to see behaviors change and, and things like that, right? A depression can mimic a lot of the, a lot of the um, symptoms of an Alzheimer's disease where you're forgetful, you're not engaged, isolation, lack of interest and things like that, right? So it's really important that once you start to see some symptoms or some changes that you go to your doctor um, and get the proper diagnosis because they will do that elimination process to arrive to the right diagnosis at that moment. If they will take your whole medical history into play to see what, what is it that is changing? What is it that is happening and how come you're starting to see some of these effects come about. Okay, well, um, well, it sounds to me that um, there's a lot of hope right now in that guys, you know, if we, if we eat better, we exercise, we stimulate our brain, we, we just, you know, reach out to people. Um, this is really, really great information. Um, do you want to unshare your screen so we can, uh, see you a little bit bigger than there we go there i am <laughs> there you are um well janice um any questions or comments no ma'am 
not right now. Okay. Well, um, if you we you have the uh, contact information uh, for Miss Vieta at the um, Alzheimer's Association chapter of Texas, and um, we have gotten some amazing information today from you. We we thank you for taking some time out of your busy schedule to for share sure. this with us. You guys are awesome partners. And I know in the past, the library has shared on social media, some upcoming workshops. So continue to send us those workshops and we will post it in our social media so that everybody can, you know, keep up with what's going on. And, um, you know, hopefully we can, we can one day have it where there's not as many people suffering with this. So that is a goal to have a survivor of Alzheimer's disease. So. Continue supporting the association, however it is that you choose to, and um, and if it is your your journey, that we're here to support you, however we can. Great, I, I love that. Yes, and and there will be, there will be. Let's keep our fingers yes. crossed. Thank you. Yes. We did well, have someone say thank you for all the information and for your time. Oh, oh thank you. Appreciate it. Well, and, and tomorrow we, we are going to continue on. This week has been a very busy week. We are going to be back to our Women's History Month. We have one of our very own CTC professors. Um, we have Dr. Leanne Temple from Fort Hood, and she's going to be talking about women in leadership and women in education and women in a lot of different things. She is our, <laughs> our go-to on women's history. And so she will be here tomorrow at noon. If you need to have attendance credit, make sure that you register for that. Thank you again. Thank you again, uh, Ms. Vieta. We truly appreciate um, your time and your information today. And we will be taking us out so bye everybody you guys have a great bye, day everyone. go Thank for a you. walk it's beautiful weather today go for a Absolutely. walk <laughs> <laughs> bye bye